In the New Testament, the word charity, uh, I believe almost every instance, is translated from the Greek word agape, which, as most of you know, means love. And uh, love is a very important thing to the body of Christ. In fact, it's probably the most powerful thing in the universe. And some would say, well, wait a minute, I thought God was the most powerful in the universe. Well, God is love, and we're going to find that today in our lecture. We'll document that. But I think because it is one of the most powerful things in the universe, that that's the reason God chose love to be the glue that holds the body of Christ together. The body of Christ is a multi-membered body. All Christians are members or parts of that body. And although Christians are quite diverse and the gifts that God has given us are quite different in many respects, we complement one another. And by that I don't mean that we say, oh Bob, that's a nice looking sport jacket, that really looks nice on you, or, or Sally, you've got a, a new hairstyle, that really looks nice. I mean complement, C-O-M-P-L-E-M-E-N-T, which means to make complete or perfect. And as a body of Christ, all of its members working together, although we have different gifts from our Father, we complement one another. And each is just as important as the other in accomplishing the overall mission of the body. What is the mission of the body of Christ? Well, I hope your mission in life is to get truth and knowledge of God's Word out to many as our lost, of our brothers and sisters who are lost in this world of darkness. So each member of the body is essential to the overall completeness or perfection of the body of Christ. And love or charity is the glue that holds that body together. Let's begin our study on concerning charity or love in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the teaching of Paul. Chapter 12, verse 1, 1 Corinthians. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. And we're, we're talking what here? What's the subject? We're talking about spiritual gifts. And Paul does a fantastic job of bringing this down where anybody should be able to understand it. Verse 2. You know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Uh, many were in the way of the Gentiles, the ways of the world, in other words. And as far as idols are concerned, remember always that that can be anything that comes between you and your Heavenly Father. And unfortunately, many of our brothers and sisters today think they are Gentiles. They don't even know who they are. Uh, they are among those who have become lost. Verse 3. Remember, always remember, God didn't lose them. They lost themselves. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. This means no good or uh, unblessed. And that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Spirit. Until that Holy Spirit touches your heart, uh, no man can say that. Now there are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit. And this is the reason we came here. There are all kinds of different gifts that God bestows upon his children. But there is only one Holy Spirit. Five. And there are differences in administrations or ministries, you could translate this. But the same Lord. There is only one Lord, and that is Jesus Christ. And we all serve him but we all serve him in different ways according to the gifts that God has given us. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Now, worketh could be energizes. So in verse 4 we have the Holy Spirit, verse 5 we have the Son, and in verse 6 we have the Father, the Trinity. 
But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, manifests itself in each of us differently. But the purpose of it is to benefit the overall body of Christ. For to one is given by the Spirit of the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. And the words uh, to express knowledge and wisdom. And don't ever forget where all knowledge comes from, important knowledge that is. There is knowledge of the ways of the world. That means nothing to us as Christians. True knowledge we learn of and in, in where it begins in Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7. The beginning or the fear of the Lord or the reverence of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. But fools despise instruction. Verse 9. To another, to another member of the body, in other words, faith by the same spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit. Many different gifts all given by the Holy Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. In the Greek, this word is dunamis, and it means it's from where our word dynamite comes from, or power, you could think of it. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. In other words, the ability to discern good from evil spirits. To another, divers kinds, or different kinds, of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. And tongues as many of you know, should be translated or could very easily be translated languages. In other words, uh, what is the mission of the body of Christ? It's to carry the, the gospel around the world. That requires that we have many different languages, the ability to speak those languages, and God gives His Spirit, gives those gifts uh, to many. Verse 11. But all these worketh that one and the self-same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. In other words, who is it that decides who gets what gifts? God, by his own will, decides who gets which gifts as it pleases him to his will, in other words. So don't ever try and utilize the gifts that God has given someone else. It becomes quite apparent whether you have that gift or not. And so the point is, if you're trying to use the gifts that God, the Holy, through His Holy Spirit, gives to others, you're most likely going to fail in helping the body of Christ. So learn to recognize the gifts that God has given you. And, and how do I do that? Well, one of the best ways, in my opinion, is to pray. If you don't know what God wants you to do, and what gift he has given you, pray and ask him. He'll reveal it to you if you ask. Verse 12. Now Paul's going to turn this a little different angle here. We've been talking, we started in verse 1 with spiritual gifts. Paul's going to make this to where nobody can misunderstand what he's trying to communicate here, and we're going to turn to the flesh a little bit. For as the body, in other words, the human body, is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Just like we have different members of, of our human flesh bodies, so is the body of Christ. Different uh, functions for different members of the body, different gifts that God has given. For by one Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, are we all baptized into one body whether we be Jews, Judeans, or Gentiles, whether we be bond, or slaves, or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. I like the way that Moffat translated this word drink. Uh, it's a word I had to go to the dictionary and look up. It's imbued, I-M-B-U-E-D. Now that's not a word that I use every, well, I started to say every week. I'm going to say I don't think I've ever used that word in my life. Imbu, interesting word. It means to, literally, it means to die. Kind of like uh, baptized. Many of you know the etymology of the word baptism is to die. I like the other meaning of it, uh, and if you look it up in the Webster's, and that's penetration. We are all penetrated with that Holy Spirit. 
when we come into the body of Christ. For the body is not one member, but many. Verse 15, If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? The foot is just as important as the hand, or any other part of the body. And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Of course it's of the body. And if you didn't have an ear, you wouldn't be able to hear or listen. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? It couldn't. You know, an eye can't hear. If the, the whole uh, were hearing, where were the smelling? An eye can't hear and, and an ear cannot smell. So different uh, functions for each part of the body, including the body of Christ. Again, Paul's putting this down to where we can compare it to something we can visualize, our own human bodies, and comparing that to the body of Christ. Verse 18. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. Don't ever forget that. The gifts are given and as it pleases God. So always remember when you're looking around and you see the gifts that others have and that little, maybe a little bit of uh, uh, envy might creep in or something. Don't allow it to happen. It pleased God to do it the way he did it. And I don't know about you, I'm sure not going to put myself in a position where I'm questioning God. And if they were all one member, say a hand for instance, where were the body? There wouldn't be a body. It would just be one huge big hand. But now are there many members, yet but one body. Pretty simple, and, and it works. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. If the eye saw the tennis ball coming towards you and you didn't have a hand to grasp the racket and strike the ball with, what good would it do for the eye to see the tennis ball coming? None. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And this, uh, not to offend, you know, we're, we're talking, he's, he's talking flesh here in a way, but this is not to offend the handicap at all. It's saying, that we all, our, our bodies are dependent on other parts of it just as the body of Christ is dependent on the other parts of it. Verse 22, Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble or delicate are necessary. Think of this as the heart or the brain. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable Upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. And to me, I think Paul in a nice way is saying there are parts of our human bodies that are not so good looking. And thank goodness for clothing. We, we can cover up those parts of the body that aren't all that great looking. For our comely, or our good-looking parts, have no need to be covered, in other words, but God hath tempered, this means to combine, the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, or giving dignity to all the different parts, realizing all are as important as the other. Why? Verse 25 that there should be no schism in the body. This is a, a division in the body. But that the members should have the same care or common concern one for another. We're all part of the same body. Uh, we couldn't make it without the other members of the body. We couldn't be successful without the other members of the body. We all depend on one another. And you know, it's kind of interesting to note that when one part of the body, and I am talking about the body of Christ here, is successful, all the other members share in that success. If one member of the body fails, all in the body of Christ uh, have the consequences of that failure, and then pull together and make it right. Verse 26, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. For one member be honored, 
uh, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. In other words, don't let there be jealousy among the members of the body of Christ. That when one is successful, we all share in that success. When one is failing, we all share in that failure as well. 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Each one of you makes up a different part of the body of Christ. And all important, not one any more important than the other. We all share in the same rewards. 28. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets. This can mean to be an inspired speaker. Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles, dunamis in the Greek again. Then gifts of healings, helps, governments or directors, diversities or different kinds of tongues, many different languages. Are all apostles? And the answer to that, of course, is no. Are all prophets? Of course not. Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Each has our own individual gifts. Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues or languages? Do all interpret or do all translate? Each member of the body has a purpose. But covet earnestly the best gifts. That means to hang on to them or desire. Be zealous for the best gifts. And yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And I like the way Moffat translated that last verse, and that is, set your heart on the higher talents, and yet I will show you a still higher path. And what is the path that Paul is getting ready to show us? That path is love. Charity, as it's translated in verse 1 of chapter 13. So all these gifts are important. And, and we should strive or, or do the best we can to hang on to the gifts that God has given us. But he's saying there's something more important than that, and that is love. Chapter 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, that's agape in the Greek, love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. You know, you've ever heard wind chimes when the wind comes? And you, you have sound as the, the chimes cling together, but there's really no song there. And, and what Paul's saying here, I think, is that if I could speak every language of men on earth, and not only that, if, if we added to that the language that the angels speak, in other words, every language in the universe, if I could speak that, but if I didn't have love, it would mean nothing too. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity or love, I am nothing. Doesn't do any good for the overall body of Christ. If you had all those gifts and you were the best uh, at teaching or whatever, if you didn't have love for the body of Christ, it would mean nothing. And though I bestow or sell all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned or sacrificed, and have not charity or love, it profiteth me nothing, and it profiteth the body of Christ nothing either. Love is a very, very important thing, is what Paul is communicating to us here. Charity suffereth long. It's, it's very, love is very patient and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. And members of the body shouldn't, in other words, get puffed up in themselves. Remember, that's Satan's downfall. That's his weakness, is his pride. And can you, and can you imagine one member of the body being jealous? That's this, what this envieth not is. Can you imagine the, the hand saying, you know, I really wish that I was the foot. I, I'm, I'm really jealous of that foot. 
And then what would the foot say? The foot would say, yeah, you'd like to be a foot until this guy puts on these shoes that are too tight or, or the athlete's feet come rolling around. And then the foot might say, well, I wish I was a hand. I mean, a head. That head has really got it made. He sits there on top of that whole body and makes decisions with that brain. And the head would say, yeah, you'd like to be the head until the headaches start rolling around. So you hear what we got is discord going on in the body if we allow these things. So the key is uh, love overcomes these things. And a uh, common sense of belonging to that body and being concerned about the overall good that that body can accomplish, which of course is the will of God getting out the truth and saving as many of our brothers and sisters as we can. Continuing on about love in verse 5. Love doth not behave itself unseemly, it's not rude, seeketh not her own, or not her own rights, you could think of this, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, no intent to injure in any way other members of the body, or anyone for that matter. Love rejoiceth not in iniquity, in injustice, or, or when others go wrong. You shouldn't rejoice when others go wrong, but you should try and help those people go right but rejoiceth, rejoiceth in the truth. And what is truth? The Word of God. And I know all of you rejoice in God's Word. Continuing about love. Beareth, or endures patiently, all things. Believeth all things. Now this doesn't mean that you're going to believe everything anyone says to you or that you read on the internet. This means that, and check it out, this word believes is especially to entrust your spiritual well-being to Jesus Christ. Hopeth all things, endureth all things. This means to persevere. And that's the thing about love. It, love does not just inadvertently disappear. You know, and you don't quit on those you love and that's an important thing not all things endure as we'll see in the next several verses eight charity or love never faileth but whether there be prophecies they shall fail there's going to be some prophecies that fail whether there be tongues or languages they shall cease whether there be knowledge it shall vanish away and Paul's a little bit hard to understand here, but where Paul's going with this, in my opinion, is that he's saying we don't know everything at this point. There, there's something that's going to supersede what we know now, and he's about to tell us what that is. Verse 9, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but in these weak flesh bodies, we just don't know and don't see the overall picture. Have we been told what we need to know? Of course. Christ said in Mark 13, Behold, I have foretold you all things. But what Paul is saying is here, when we get to chapter 15 of this 1 Corinthians, as you, many of you know, we go from fit flesh bodies to spiritual bodies. And I really believe that our mental capabilities in the flesh are severely restricted to what they will be in the spirit. And that first day, I can't wait for it. I think we're all going to be walking around going, oh, that's what that meant in Romans. Or, I, I've always wondered about that. And then all of a sudden, your brain, your, your mental capabilities are able to grasp a hold of it and hang on to. And that's what Paul's saying here. Yeah, we know part. Of, of the overall picture, but we don't know it all. Verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, in other words, when we are in those spiritual bodies, I think is what he means, then that which is in part shall be done away with. The partial knowledge that we have now will be superseded um, in our spiritual bodies. 
11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child or on a child's level. I thought as a child, but when I became a man or an adult, I put away childish things. In other words, take responsibility when you mature, particularly as a Christian. And to me, that a key to that is making sure that the body of Christ is successful. Verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, and this really loses it, uh, when we look into a mirror, we see a riddle. In other words, when I get up in the morning, I go to the bathroom, and I walk up to the mirror sometimes, and I turn on the light, and I wish I'd not turned on the light, you know. But uh, Moffat, I like the way he translates this. When we look into the mirror, we see baffling reflections. In other words, Paul says, when I look at myself, I... I'm, I'm confused sometimes. I, I really don't know. But then face to face. Now I, Paul speaking, know in part. But then when we go into those spiritual bodies, shall I know even as also I am known. And I think what he's saying here is, I'm going to know myself as God knows me. I'm going to understand a lot more than what I understand now. 13 to complete the chapter, and now abideth, or uh, lasts on, you could translate. Faith, hope, and our word charity, love. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Love, the strongest force in the universe. It, it's the glue that holds the body of Christ together. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. I want to document that that love is the glue. Colossians 3. I'm going to pick it up with verse 1. And it reads... If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And when, if you believe that Christ rose from the dead, in a way, that's a resurrection in itself that people, when you become a Christian, you resurrect upon that belief to a different level. You, you want to please God at that point. You don't want to do anything. You don't want to mess up. Yeah, we all fall short. We all sin. But you don't want to do that. And in other words, seek things from in, that are in your spiritual level rather than those that are on earth. And he says as much in verse 2. Set your affection or your mind on things above, not on things uh, on the earth. And when... We become, you know, wrapped up in the ways of the world sometimes. It's awful easy to do, especially in this fast-paced lifestyle that we live in now. I think we'd be better off to go back to the days when people sat around on their front porch and, and talked with their neighbors rather than going home, plopping down in the easy chair and turning on the boob tube. You know, life has just gotten so fast-paced that it's awful easy to... to let the things of the world start affecting you more than they should. So, uh, especially when you're making decisions in your life, always try and think spiritual rather than the ways of the world, things that are on earth. Three, the reason, for ye are dead. In other words, your flesh body is going to die. And your life, your eternal life, is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. What a promise. When, when he is manifest, uh, Christians will be made manifest with him also. Verse 5, mortify. This means to, to put to death. Therefore your members, and we're talking about the members of your flesh body, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, which is lust, evil concupiscence, easy for you to say, which is ardent desire, 
and covetousness or greed, which is idolatry. Again, anything that comes between you and your relationship with your heavenly Father, you've let it be allowed it to become your idol. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, the children of unbelief, you could translate this. And that's one thing I don't know about you, I wouldn't care to have come upon me is the wrath of God. In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. And Paul's talking about the ways of the world, the ways of the Gentiles. Until you became a Christian, you also behaved as they did. But now ye also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, which is uh, communi words that have little account or bile, empty, wicked, out of your mouth. Lie not or deceive not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deed, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him, that's God, that created him, the likeness, uh, an image, a likeness, or a pattern. Verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew or Judean, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, which is a savage, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. And here that covers the whole gambit. If you're a slave, if you're free, if you're a savage or a barbarian, Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels or heart of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness or gentleness, long-suffering. Well, that's a hard one for some of us, that long-suffering. You know, we all think everyone else should be more patient, but when it comes down to us being more patient ourselves, eh, that's a little bit harder nut to crack. So that's something that we all could work on. Verse 13, forbearing or bearing with one another and forgiving one another if any man hath a quarrel or a complaint against any, even as Christ forgave, you so also do ye. And that's necessary. Christ paid an awesome price on the cross. He forgave our sins. And, you know, when someone, even if it's a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ, when someone does you wrong, it's important for you to forgive that person. If you don't, you allow it to become that little watermelon seed that's in your throat before you know, you turn around and it's grown into a full-blown watermelon you're walking around within your throat. So for your own well-being, it's important that you learn to forgive. Fourteen, the reason we came here. And above all these things, Paul's saying this, this is more important. Above all these things, put on charity. There we have our Greek word, agape, love, which is the bond of perfectness. Love is that glue that holds the perfect body of Christ together. Very, very important. Turn with me as we continue to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. There's another benefit to love. And I don't know about you, but I sure am glad it's there. 1 Peter chapter 4. Have any of you got sins that you need to be covered? Well, I know I do. We all fall short. And love will cover a multitude of sins. Chapter 4, verse 1. 1 Peter. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, he paid that price, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that have suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Verse 2. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. That's something else we as Christians should work on more, I think, is 
understanding, first of all, the will of God and also doing the will of God. You can't just be a hearer of the word. You have to be a hearer and a doer. James chapter 1, uh, I believe verse 22 and 23 would document that. But if you're living in the will of God, the ways of the world don't influence you as much. You got your priorities in order. You know what's important in life. And it certainly isn't the ways of the world and what they bring. Verse 3, for the time past of your life may suffice us to have wrought or worked the will of the Gentiles, or the, the way of the world, when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, reveling, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange, those who are living in the ways of the world, that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. You, you try and do things right, and you try your best to do the will of God, others are going to talk about you. Uh, how come he's not going with us down to the local place and getting a six-pack anymore? You know, what, what happened to him? And then they're, they're going to talk evil of you. Verse 5, Who shall give account to him, this is to God, that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. And there is only one judge. The quick here, better translated, the living and the dead, of course, the spiritually dead. There's only one judge and those who are living at the end of the millennium, spiritually we're speaking, are going to be judged the same as those who are spiritually dead. Uh, the judgment won't be the same, but they will be judged. Verse 6, for for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. I think this verse points back to chapter 3, verse 19. Where did Christ go when after he was crucified? Well, the first thing he did was he rent that veil from top to bottom. He also went to the prisoners and preached the gospel to them. Would not have been fair for God to judge all those who had passed away prior to the crucifixion to be judged against the same, not the same as those who uh, lived after the crucifixion. Just would not have been fair. And our Father is fair. But the end of all things is at hand. The judge is standing at the door. Be ye therefore sober, this means of a sound mind, and watch unto prayer. And we as watchmen, of course, have a very big responsibility to the body of Christ as well as being watchmen. And above all things, again Paul's saying, most important of all, have fervent charity or love among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. And why is that? Well, I think it's because we're told through God's Word. And in the next scripture that we go to, it's a commandment from God that we love one another, the body of Christ. And when we do that, we're working to make sure that that body performs to its max, that we're accomplishing the most that we can possibly accomplish. And if we love the Father, of course, uh, we're going to try and do what is right as well. Carry, covers a multitude of sins. Nine, use hospitality one to another without grudging, without grumbling, in other words. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Verse 11, and we'll stop in this particular scripture. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. In other words, in harmony or in accordance with the word of God. If any man minister or serve, let him do it as the ability which God giveth. And that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Learn to speak God's doctrine, when, especially if you are trying to help one of your brothers and sisters see the truth. 
and it's important that we glorify, notice in that verse, glorify God in all things. Let Him be glorified. And that's what's important, is that we glorify Him uh, as opposed to ourselves. And, you know, that's an awful easy thing for, for human beings to do. When something's going good in your life and you've accomplished something, you look around and you go, look what I did with my hands. And you forget where the gifts came from that let you accomplish that. You forget to glorify God. In that case, you're glorifying yourself, which is, uh, uh, you don't want to do that. Glorify God in all things. I said we're going to document that God is love. And I want to, in conclusion, turn to the first epistle of John. Chapter 4. First epistle of John, chapter 4. John, one of the more tender writers uh, of the New Testament. And you can just almost feel the love coming uh, through the writings of John, one of my, my favorites. I, I shouldn't say that. They're all my favorites. But you can't help it. Every once in a while you like one, you know. Chapter 4, first epistle of John, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try or test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Jesus warned us in Matthew chapter 24 about these false ones. He said, they'll come to you saying, I'm a Christian. But what John is saying is, don't believe everyone that comes to you saying, I'm a Christian. Or, did you see what the internet said about so-and-so, or this and that? Test the, the spirits. Test whether we have truth here or not. Two, hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. On the other hand, and every spirit that confesseth not, or, or acknowledges not, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it would, should come. And even now, already, is it in the world. And yes, it is in the world, but, beloved, we haven't seen anything yet compared to what it's going to be like when the Antichrist is here himself. Ye are of God, little children. Again, that tenderness of John's writing. You darling children, you could translate. And have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And the he here that is in the world, Satan. And Christ gave you power over Satan and his. Don't forget to use it. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We have the victory, beloved. Verse 5, They are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. The world understands their ways. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us, or understands us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know ye we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, or the spirit of deception. I like to think of that error. Verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another. Now this word love, the first time here, is agapeo, which is a form of the Greek word we've been talking about, agape. One another, for love, this is agape, is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. Verse 8, He that loveth not, <clears throat> knoweth not God, for God is love. And here we have agape. Our Heavenly Father is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Here's proof that God loves us. Because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him might live eternally through the price he paid. 
herein is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation of our sins. The uh, atonement, concretely, this means the expiator, or He who covered our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. How true that is. The, we're one body. We're one family. We're, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And if he loved us enough to pay that price on the cross, and when we're talking about he sent his son, uh, I'll remind you of Isaiah chapter 7, Emmanuel would be his name, which means what? God with us. He was willing to do that himself, and that, beloved, is proof of his love. No man hath seen God at any time. And why is that? Because in the flesh and blood, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. We can't even see into the kingdom of God. Uh, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, verse 50. Different dimension. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. And his love is perfected in us. And that Holy Spirit that Christ promised in, in John, St. John chapter 14, he would send, he would not leave us comfortless, but he would send the comforter, the Holy Spirit. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit, freely gave that spirit to us. And you know it's real. You know, there's so many people that treat Christianity like it's a religion. You, I know, know it's a reality. You have felt that Holy Spirit touch your heart. You, you know His presence, and you feel His presence. And we have seen and do testify that the Lord sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. He's the gate. He's the way. He's the only salvation. And again, part of the, the mission of the body of Christ is to share that way with the world so that others can find what you have. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And that's how you distinguish spirits. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. Here we have it again for emphasis. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. No gray area, no maybe you do, maybe you don't. Herein is our love made perfect or complete, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. What about you on the day of judgment? Are you going to be able to be bold? I tell you, I think those who are so wrapped up in the ways of the world that they don't have time for their Heavenly Father right now, when it comes around to Judgment Day, I don't think they're going to be too bold when they walk in before that white throne. So I hope you're able to walk in before that white throne boldly expecting rewards. You know, judgment is not all punishment. It's rewards as well. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Think about that. There is no fear in love, but perfect or mature or complete love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment or punishes those who are experiencing it. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. If you are a mature Christian, you have nothing to fear. You've read God's word and you understand that we have the victory. Verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. And God, in other words, God created your soul and he loves you. Uh, it's written in Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 that he created everything. That includes you for his pleasure. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother... He is a liar. In other words, he doesn't love his brother. He doesn't love God. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? That, that just doesn't add up. 21 to conclude, And this commandment have we from him, that he who loved God love his brother 
also. And not as Cain, who slew his brother Abel, but that's a commandment. Did you understand that last verse from God? That we love one another. And why is that so important? Because God is love. Love is what holds the body of Christ together where we're able to accomplish uh, God's will. So with that, let's go to his throne. Yahweh Heavenly Father, we thank you for being a God of love, Father. Uh, we know many who teach you to be a God of hellfire and brimstone, Father. I think many attempting to hold their congregation in the pews through fear, Father. We know that you're a God of love. We feel your love when you touch our heart through your Holy Spirit, Father. We thank you for the many gifts that you've given this body of Christ, Father. We pray that we'll be able to serve you, Father, in accomplishing your will through the body of Christ. In Yeshua Jesus' precious name, amen.